This is a neural network, and a lot of people believe this is the source of human consciousness and all the subjective experiences that we have in our lives. Some circles interconnected with some lines. And if you think that's reductionist, there's a growing community of folks who hold the view that rocks are conscious, but that's a topic for another video. The high level ideas behind these neural networks are actually really easy to understand. If you wanna dive into the details, things can get a little more involved. For neural networks in the brain, there's a lot of chemistry, and in artificial neural networks, you have some calculus, but you don't need to go that deep to appreciate the core ideas. Also, I collaborated with the publisher of this book to make sure the cover matched perfectly with the background color of my set. See that? I'm kidding, actually that was just serendipity. Anyway, more on this book in a bit. Neural networks are the key to all the recent advances in large language models. They're the key to your short and long-term memory. They're the key to facial recognition in photos, the key to self-driving cars. The term neural network is a generic term that can either refer to the artificial neural networks that we build in software, or the triple ends in our brains, you know, natural neural networks. You might be surprised by the ways that artificial neural networks are similar to biological neural networks, but you might be even more surprised by how they're different. This book is written by computational neuroscientist Grace Lindsay, and it's called Models of the Mind. And this isn't sponsored or anything, and I'm really cautious around evangelizing the reading of books, but this one is special. Long story short, it focuses on how our understanding of the brain's inner workings has evolved over the years, and the resulting ability through modeling to replicate a lot of its functionality in computer Computers. And since some of the brain's most impressive capabilities have been successfully replicated in computers, it's naturally to start wondering, well, is the brain doing something that can never be replicated in machines? Or is it inevitable that we're eventually going to make a machine that's conscious in the way that humans are? I'm gonna share my perspective on this stuff, which has been heavily influenced by the book. Oh, and if you're a little bit younger, this book is fantastic too. First, we'll take a look at artificial neural networks. You know, the ones that help you make your obnoxious AI art. Artificial neural networks take a set of numbers as input, which can be anything. They can be the color values of pixels from an image, the history of a stock price, a prompt to a language model, the prompt text is ultimately converted to a bunch of numeric vectors. Each one of these nodes on the left represents an input to the network. If the input is a 32 by 32 pixel image, I don't know, say you're doing image recognition on characters from Super Mario World for some reason. You'd have 1,024 of these input nodes, each representing a pixel color value from the sprite. Our goal is to have the network tell us which character appears in the input image. Is it Koopa? Is it Mario? Is it a Goomba? Those possibilities are represented by these output neurons on the right side. Output neurons are also numbers, so for a classification task like this, we associate a character with each output neuron. The output node with the highest value tells us which character the input image has been classified as. So in this case, that would be the Goomba. Then we have this middle layer here. And depending on the network, this might be an oversimplification. A lot of networks actually have multiple hidden layers. In what's called a feedforward neural network, every neuron in each layer has a connection to each neuron in the previous layer. For image classification, typically a slightly different architecture called a convolutional neural network is used, but we're gonna kinda ignore that for now. Again, the value of each input node is based on the value of a pixel in the input image. We start with those values, and then we compute the values of each subsequent layer in the network, culminating in the computation of the output values on the right. Each of its connections to the input nodes has a numeric weight associated with it, which controls how significantly the value of the input node impacts the computed value of the node that we're looking at. Maybe the node in the middle layer needs to determine if there's brightness in the center area of the image, because that turns out to be useful for recognizing some character. The connections from those pixels might have higher weights than the connections from other pixels. To compute the value of a node in the middle layer, we multiply each connected input neuron with the weight of its connection, and then sum them all up. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it conveys the main idea. Then we repeat the same process for the output layer, using the values computed for the middle layer as input. As we said before, once we've computed the values for the output neurons, we look for the output neuron with the highest value and consider the input image classified as a character associated with that neuron, in this case, the Goomba. Of course, neural networks aren't guaranteed to get things right all the time. The weights we assign each connection might not produce the right classification for every possible input image. So where do these weights come from? They're computed in a training process, which involves showing the network some training data which consists of example images along with the correct classification for each of those images. This is where the history of machine learning gets really interesting and it's one of the things that Models of the Mind covers really well. I'll kind of summarize it, but for the full story, definitely check out the book. Because get this, the basic idea for neural networks is actually from the 1950s. In 1958, the United States built a machine called the Perceptron that was pretty successful at correctly classifying 20 by 20 pixel images. Scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. They didn't have Goombas back then, so they actually use it to classify useful things like handwritten digits. The original Perceptron was kind of like the neural network we just looked at, 
but it only had one input layer and one output layer. It didn't have any hidden layers. A fellow named Marvin Minsky pointed out that this architecture turns out to be really limiting. He proved that there are some basic functions that this type of network just can't do. Adding hidden layers was proposed pretty early on, but initially nobody could figure out how to rethink the perceptron training algorithm to account for those extra layers. Eventually a viable technique for training networks with extra layers was discovered, but it wasn't until 1986, which was a full 28 years after the perceptron was built. A fellow named Jeffrey Hinton published a paper describing how to use a technique called backpropagation to train neural networks with essentially an unbounded number of layers. The high level intuition behind backpropagation is that it tells us how we should update the weights across the entire network when something's misclassified. So this Goomba was misclassified as princess. How do we know how to update this weight all the way on the left side of the network to reduce that error in the future? It's non-trivial and some neural networks could be multiple layers deep. They might not just have one hidden layer. So it's not immediately obvious how we should update the weights on the first layer way back at the beginning, such that this error is minimized. And backpropagation turns out to be a really good solution to that problem. Still to this day, backpropagation is central to how neural networks are trained and how we come up with these weights. Okay, so that's how artificial neural networks work. How does this compare to how the brain works? Theoretically, when considering how the brain is wired, you could use a diagram similar to the one that we use for artificial neural networks, but it would be a huge oversimplification. The basic idea is the same in that you have this signal chain of neurons and neurons downstream in the signal chain can selectively incorporate input from upstream neurons. But there are a number of other dimensions at play when we're talking about the human brain. I mean that both literally and figuratively. This is one of the things that the book really opened my eyes to. Let's zoom into one of these neurons. The neuron receives its input in the form of an electrical signal traveling down what are called dendrites in purple. These signals come from the activity of upstream neurons. We'll get to that in a second. The medium through which a neuron sends its output is called an axon in green here. That axon then might connect to dendrites of other neurons. Whenever the co collective sum of a neuron's input breaches a certain voltage threshold, it sends an electrical signal down the axon, which is called an action potential, often abbreviated AP. The connection between a neuron's dendrite and the axon of another neuron is called the synapse in orange here. The stuff that happens at the synapse actually has a huge impact on the propagation of the signal. At a high level, the signal coming down the upstream axon is electric. At the synapse, the signal might cause a chemical called a neurotransmitter to be released. The dendrite on the other side of this connection has what's called a receptor, which may react to the neurotransmitter by propagating another electrical signal down the dendrite toward the next neuron, neuron B. One interesting thing is that the resulting signal in the dendrite could either be excitatory, increasing the chances that the downstream neuron will fire, or it could be inhibitory, actually acting against having the downstream neuron fire. And things get even crazier. Here's something I learned in the book that really blew my mind. Say we have a number of upstream neurons, A, B, and C, all connecting to the same dendrite of a downstream neuron, D. If signals come from all the upstream neurons at the same time, they'll all arrive at the downstream neuron at different times because of the time it takes for the electrical signals to travel down the dendrite. What this means is that only when the upstream neurons fire in a very specific order will they cause the downstream neuron to fire. The locations of the connections actually make the system a temporal pattern matcher. The upstream neurons have to fire in a very specific sequence to trigger an action potential in the downstream neuron D. I thought that was crazy. I'm not sure there's any analog to this in artificial neural networks. And then we have learning. In artificial neural networks, we have backpropagation, which is really effective for a lot of tasks. But it appears that animal brains don't do anything like backpropagation. On top of that, it seems like there are a number of different learning mechanisms at play, with some parts of the brain preferring one over the other. One of the more common ones is called Hebbian learning, which is ascribed by the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. The idea is actually pretty straightforward. When a downstream neuron like D fires at the same time as an upstream neuron like A, the connection between those two neurons is strengthened at the synapse. So then an action potential at A becomes more likely to cause D to fire an action potential. But this technique alone is not a direct replacement for backpropagation. It isn't as holistic as something like backpropagation where an error in the output of a network can lead to weight adjustments clear on the other side of the network in an effort to reduce that error. Hebbian learning is more of an isolated kind of local technique. Okay, going back to our feed forward artificial neural network, all of this complexity we just talked about in biological neural networks is approximated by the set of numbers or connection weights, which are computed using something like backpropagation. So we have all these complex interactions that work in the neurons and synapses, and in our model of it, artificial neural networks, we represent all of it with a number in the form of a weight. The first chapter in Models of the Mind is called Spherical Cows. 
And what she's trying to convey in this chapter is that the goal of modeling something isn't replicating it perfectly. It's to capture the most important details. And I think of numeric weights as a prime example of that. But at the same time, the human brain, at least at the time this video is being made, has capabilities that haven't yet been replicated using artificial neural networks. So it seems possible that some of the extra complexity in biological neural networks that hasn't yet been incorporated into our current models might be key to these capabilities. Are we going to create machines with human-like intelligence? I don't know what the time frame is going to be, but I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes. Is it going to be done by replicating exactly what the brain does? I'm not so sure about that. The easy analog there is airplanes. We could have gone the route of imitating what birds do, but we got a much better result by employing a completely different strategy. And then there's the inevitable question. Are we ever going to make machines that have consciousness in the way that humans are conscious? It's not a satisfying answer, but I think the reality is that even if we create a machine that is conscious in the same way that we are, we'll never be able to confirm or refute it. So it's kind of a moot question. That might not be what most people were hoping to hear, but I think that's the reality we live in. We take for granted that other humans are conscious just because we are conscious. We see other humans and they seem to be acting conscious too, so we assume that they are conscious in the same way that we are. But the weird reality is that we have no way of proving that they are having the same subjective conscious experience as us. So far, it doesn't seem that consciousness in machines is going to be any easier to confirm or refute. We could have the most realistic robot or language model that acts just like a human, but the reality is that even given the most convincing human-like behaviors, there's just no way to confirm or refute whether it has subjective experience. That is some of my current perspective on the state of biological and artificial intelligence. Again, this isn't sponsored or anything, but if you'd like to support the channel and you're interested in reading models of the mind, I'll have an affiliate link in the description below. If you made it to the end of this video, I'd say there's a pretty high chance that you'll enjoy it. If you want a really easy way to run the current state-of-the-art open source language models in your computer, a lot of these things are very, very close in performance to something like ChatGPT. Definitely check out this video about an open source project called Olama. It's getting pretty popular, but I think it's still somewhat unrecognized in the industry. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.